the big thing we have going on in weed science, uh, unfortunately, is resistance. And resist weed resistance takes up the majority of my time uh, on a day-to-day basis, whether it's phone calls or field calls or trying to develop programs in the crops that we grow here in Arkansas. Welcome to the Crop Science Podcast Show. My name is Brian Arnell, and I'm coming to you from Oklahoma State University. Today, happy to have what I would consider a, a friend of mine. We've, we've had a lot of interaction over the years. He's Dr. Tom Barber, Professor Extension Weed Scientist at the University of Arkansas. You know, Tom's uh, bio reads that he's an extension program focused on weed control, weed resistance management, and outreach in Arkansas and the Mid-South. Each year, his weed science program conducts over 120 applied research trials in corn, cotton, grain sorghum, rice sorghum, and pe- soybean and peanut crops. Tom uh, gives at least 50 presentations annually at local, state, and regional, discussing everything that he does to all the key clientele. In addition, Dr. Barber was named the director of the Newport Extension Center in 2018, which is a 400-acre research demonstration farm in Jackson County, Arkansas. Tom, first, welcome to the podcast. Happy to have you on today. Oh, thanks, Brian. I appreciate the invitation. And uh, when you read it all back to me like that, it sounds kind of depressing. I don't know. <laughs> I, I feel you on that one. So, so Tom, uh, to kind of dive in and tell the the you know the audience a little bit about you, how did you end up where you're at at U of A doing what you do? And then kind of take that and then lead us into some of your ongoing research and extension work. Sure. So I, I grew up in a small on a small farm in, in southwest Arkansas, not far from uh, Texarkana. And so that kind of bred into me the love for agriculture. We had row crops, we had cows, we had a little bit of everything, uh, I guess, other than chickens. But uh, just like any other teenager or any of mine that are in college right now, a lot of them are struggling to know what to do. And then I somehow ran into uh, Dr. Dick Oliver at Fayetteville while I was up there. Uh, working on an undergrad and he convinced me to work for him for one summer and I just kind of fell in love with weed science after that and so uh, got my master's there at the U of A under Oliver and and Ford Baldwin uh, who's a well-known extension guy in the south back then and uh, still is today I still get questions about well Ford said do it like this are we still doing it like that and a lot of it still holds true and so <laughs> that's how much things have changed since the 90s, 80s and 90s, you know, but uh, went to Mississippi State for a little bit, got my PhD under Dan Reynolds there. Uh, I had an opportunity to work for Mississippi State as an extension cotton specialist for three to three and a half years. And then, uh, like a lot of us, got an opportunity to move back closer to home. And so uh, that's what I was able to do in 2007. Moved over, was a cotton agronomist or extension specialist for a few years. And then, uh, in 2012, moved back into wheat science. So it's it's been a long journey, but when you talk about it, it doesn't seem like it's been over 20 years, but it's been over 20 no. years. So I don't know. Explore the future of agriculture with KWS, a global leader in innovation and sustainable farming practices. Uncover the exceptional qualities of our hybrid rye, cultivating a legacy for a greener tomorrow. Visit kws.com forward slash US for more information and for dealer locations. KWS, seeding the future since 1856. So, Tom, I want to hit, because you actually said something that I thought was interesting. So, both of your major advisors, most of your major profs, uh, Oliver and Reynolds, you know, I'm a soil scientist. I don't, you, the weed science, you guys have too many treatments in a plot that just confused me. But you, you work for two names that, even I, as a soil scientist, you know, know exceptionally well. Those are two strong programs, especially in the Mid-South, for weed science. And I I think so many folks I come across have ties or knowledge of that. You know, tell a little bit about those programs. You know, reminisce a little bit about, because they're big programs, and I like to share when it's something like that. They really are, and I didn't didn't know the the size, I guess, uh, or the family I would join at the time. Uh, but when you, you know, I think, uh, all of us that graduated under Dick Oliver, we all feel connected to some shape, form or fashion, whether we were in graduate school together or not, uh, just because of the way he conducted his research and the intensity of his program. He, 
I think he calmed down a little bit when I was there, but I he was still pretty intense while I was there. <laughs> but uh, I think if we got together and had a reunion, I mean, it would be – I don't even know how many would show up. His numbers that he graduated and, and just the sheer – a uh, number of people that are working in the ag sector right now that have ties back to him is is amazing to me. And the same with with Dan Reynolds and David Shaw at, at Mississippi State. We at the recent uh, Southern Wheat Science meetings and WSSA joint meeting, we had a alumni event. Mississippi State had an alumni event, and I mean we filled up a whole restaurant basically of uh, of just you know, students who had come through at some point in time and now moved on. And so it's it's nice to be part of a family like that, I guess. But, yes, they have uh, a lot of reputation there in the field of weed science. I was just fortunate to be a part of their program and, and learn for them. So. You know, for anybody that doesn't go through that, that, you know, the master's and PhD, I also came from a large program and there, there's two different types. You have those profs that have one or two grads and those profs that have a whole herd. And, you know, in my major, Bill Ron, he had, he gave, we figured out with the time of his passing, he had 90 students, but conferred 140 degrees, something along those lines. And so you're right, that family mentality and even just going through your program is a large program versus small program. It, it I've seen the differences and the large programs, especially seem to, to have an appreciation for the family tree. Cause I go, I go talk to grad students every year. I was like, you should know your family tree. You should know your aunts and uncles and greats and, and all that and stuff. Cause it's really the, the academic tree as it would. It's really fascinating because you, you really end up saying, Oh, you know, that's why I kind of that's why I was taught this is because I can trace it back to maybe, you know, maybe it was Oliver's prof that had a approach to something that he then passed down. And I always find that just fun to look back. Right. I do, too. And I, I don't want to give out any cheat sheets on our Ph.D. written exams, but but names are always on there. And, we're, <laughs> and I, we expect them to know names. So anyway. Okay, done with reminiscing. Sorry, the 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 names of, of Oliver and Reynolds just brought that on as a somebody that's not even in that field that I'm well aware of them. So, Tom, what are you doing in Arkansas right now? What's some ongoing work, uh, whether it's research or extension based? Well, right now, uh, of course, we're geared up for spring, and as we mentioned before, we got started here. It's been seventy five degrees the last couple of days, so we're trying to pump the great pump the brakes on some over eager uh, corn producers right now to try to keep them to leave the seed in the sack. But, but uh, the big thing we have going on in weed science, uh, unfortunately is resistance and resist weed resistance takes up the majority of my time uh, on a day to day basis, whether it's phone calls or field calls or trying to develop programs in the crops that we grow here in Arkansas and, and our top three, a uh, one which is growing in the field right now is Italian ryegrass. Uh, it's a huge problem for us, and it has spread just rapidly over the last four or five years from the southernmost portions of the state all the way through the north and into the into the boot hill of Missouri. And so uh, that's the one we're dealing with immediately uh, for our programs in season. Uh, we ma- we develop herbicide programs around Palmer amaranth and barnyard grass. Those are our top two. And, uh, you know, we, we hope we catch all the other weeds while doing that. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. But those are the two that we're worried about the most right now in season. Well, I, I'd like to blame Arkansas for our Italian ryegrass problem, but I don't think we can. Uh, but we, we struggle with that in, in Oklahoma, too. What's, what's some of the approaches that y'all are taking uh to combat italian ryegrass and and i guess it it is probably a weed that's not known everywhere as far as you know being a significant problem so you know highlight some of its challenges i guess and then your approaches to management well so when i back to graduate school when i was a graduate student under dick oliver and ford baldwin that was my project, Italian ryegrass. Back then, we had over a million acres of wheat in Arkansas, and ryegrass had just become resistant to holon, the most popular herbicide used to control it, or diclofops. So that was my project as a master's student. 
Um, and that was over, <laughs> I, I don't even want to say how long that was, over 20 years ago, anyway, 22 years ago, and we're still dealing with it now. And so, um, but we don't grow near as much wheat. And so now uh, our management strategies changed a little bit. One thing that we've noted, one of the best treatments back uh, in through my program and, and from my research was uh, following the field in the fall or through the winter and, and controlling the first, the main first flush you get of Italian ryegrass. If we could control those flushes the next year, uh, we would be much better off and could easily manage it in, in season. Now we're seeing five, six, seven flushes of ryegrass throughout, throughout the wet fall, winter months. And so even though we're not growing wheat, that still becomes a tremendous problem when we look at planting, particularly our, our, or cereal crops or grain crops like corn or rice, you know, and, and the, the yield loss potential there. And so we've, we've made a big push from an educational standpoint to using uh, residual herbicides in the fall uh, just because of resistance. So our, our ryegrass right now is, uh, of course, we mentioned diclofob. We're not using any of the FOPs to control it, but but uh, it's glyphosate resistant. It's mo at least 50% of its ALS resistance. And then we have some small pockets of clethodim or ACCA, another ACCA uh, herbicide resistance in southeast Arkansas. Yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned that because I used to feel like even when I was doing stuff 15 years ago that I could delay sowing, delay planting my wheat enough, get that first flush of rye, get it burned off, and then get in. And I just don't feel anymore that that delayed planting on my wheat wheat ground gets me. I still feel like I have continuous flushing that I'm just, if I don't have a, if I don't combine a good pre with good incorporation of pre, which in my heavy no-till is not always a guarantee in fall when our falls have not been good for, I might have moisture in the soil to plant my seed, but I don't have a lot of moisture to get that, that, um, residual down into the soil in my no-till. I've, I've, I've struggled. Yeah, it, it's a challenge and, and it's a challenge for our growers because, and I don't want, you know, I know this isn't an economic podcast, but we came off a pretty good yield year in 2023. Uh, we had some of the best yielding crops that we've had in a while. And yet I still hear the story. We're not making any money. We're making all this yield and we're still not making any money. And so these fall applications, we know through research, are the absolute best way to control it, but it's the hardest message to get accepted, I guess, because it's just an extra expense in the fall when we're trying to pay, pay all the bills. Are you guys running a fall and a spring shot? Are you mixing up your chemistries, hitting something in the fall, and hit something in spring? I'm guessing around green up. So... Yes, it, it just de it depends. <laughs> and yeah, so a, a lot of the work that we're doing, you know, we're trying to get, and it's challenging again, and it's hard for people to wrap their mind around. I'm putting a residual out in October that I'm wanting to last till April 1. That's a lot of time, right? And so depending on our winter months, we can get it sometimes, sometimes we can't. Uh, a lot of people want to go the, the Valor or Flumioxazin route because it's cheap. I mean, we're getting it out for, you know, less than $2 an ounce just about. So it's around 4 bucks, and you can have a pretty good residual program. But it's only about 60% control, and it's not going to last all the way through the month of March. And so it just, depending on our temperature fluctuations, and, and uh, we've talked about the number of flushes we can get, we always get another one somewhere in the middle of March and the middle of April. Somewhere in there, we're going to get another flush in general. So, well, I'm going to I'm going to switch topics real quick, but reintroduce you today. We are excited to have Dr. Tom Barber on. He's a University of Arkansas Extension Weed Scientist. So, Tom, let's get to something that I bet more the the audience cares about because they don't all have wheat. I'd care about wheat, but. Uh, you know, that, 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 that P word that you mentioned, that Palmer. Right. Uh, yeah. Talk about the fun times because everybody around the nation loves that word. Well, everybody needs to come get them a sample of our pigweed and take it back home with them so they can all have as much fun as, as we're having over here. Um, we've got, uh, there's a county in Arkansas called Crittenden County. It is ground zero for 
Palmer pigweed or Palmer amaranth and uh, resistance development. And so we're, we're, we're struggling, struggling mightily in several counties, but that one, it seems like that's where the, you know, the first resistance starts to show up to new chemistry. So. Well, you just, it's, it's in the water. Y'all breed them well down there. We blame Tennessee. I'm thinking it's coming across (laughs) the river. You know, it's prevailing winds don't usually come from the East, but that's my story and, and I'm sticking to it. So, uh, but no, I mean, we're, we're in a situation now where we have to budget for more herbicide. If we're in cotton or beans, I mean, we've two residuals up front, no questions asked, and we've got to pick the right residual because we have populations that are tolerant to seven modes of action. And, so, and so, so we that run brings, out of them yeah. pretty quick. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, you're, you're right. I mean, you run out of options. And so, you know, we've got a whole environment society we're really trying to get to the sustainability the whole lot of discussion of you know cover crop and all this stuff but do you see more in row tillage coming in as a i mean i around here we've seen a lot of a lot of cultivators ripped out of the old fence rows last couple of years we're, we're going to be forced to do it um i don't a lot of our growers in this area it it, it takes something like that to happen to force them to do a proactive approach a lot of times uh, again just going back to expenses and and you know the you know trying to make some money at the end of the year and we have a lot of in their defense we have a lot of absentee landowners that are just looking for a check and if the farmer down the road offers them a little more money then why am I spending more money to clean up a mess when I might not even get the field next year you know and and so it, there, it's a dynamic that we're trying to, you know, loop everybody into the communication because that's what it's going to take uh, for our recommendations. But we just we're about to complete a six year long term study in cotton looking at, you know, a good chemical strategy, obviously, but other cultural mechanical factors to control these populations. And that's to me, that is the answer. I actually have a slide that I. Everywhere I go talk, I say, what's the answer to multiple resistant pigweed control? And then I list them all out. And as you add cultural practices, deep tillage is one that, you know, nobody wants to talk about anymore, but it's very effective. Cover crops is pretty popular to talk about. Something like zero tolerance, removing any escapes, you know, over time. And so as we add all of those multiple cultural practices with an effective multiple mode of action residual program, we bring the seed bank numbers way down. We've got a huge data set to prove that. It's just being able to implement that at the farm level sometimes. Yeah. So. I, I've got guys and, and, and I've been, this is a slide that I've been hitting lately. It's uh it's becoming much better of a thing. And it's first started with nutrient stratification and concern of, excessive uh, phosphorus in the soil surface and, and runoff to now it's, it's multiple tans and or multiple flanges. And I've got guys now that are 25. One guy had 28 years of no-till and a cotton rotation. It just could not control it anymore. A lot of organic matter in the surface, a lot of heavy phosphorus in the surface, flip the ground once, run it over with the cultivator real quick, something to knock it down and put grass on the top. And now what he did is he buried that seed that was seven way resistant, 10 inches deep, probably brought up new seed, but at least it's not seven way resistant. He's got an organic matter at depth. So it's seven inches down. He now has this nice deep band of organic matter of phosphorus, potassium, and going right into conservation tillage on top and being much more aggressive and thoughtful about his herbicide and his cultural practices and using that as a little bit of a, of a reset. Although I always have to caution, it's not saying I give him the, the okay to, you know, plow every year. Cause that's not the answer, but bury it for 10 or 15 years and, and let's reboot and let's, let's be thoughtful about how, but also we got fence rows. We, he better be v- very good about controlling and knowing what his neighbors got because just because you flip a field and fix that field, if everything around you, right? I mean, if if your bar ditches and your fence rows are nothing but but Palmer, how good have you done? That's exactly. I mean, that's exactly right. And we 
we've seen in a couple of our counties have taken a pro- producer, really producer activated community approach, if, if, I, if I can, and, and just keeping everyone accountable. Hey, you, you know, you clean up your stuff, I'll clean up mine, and we're in this together. And when, when they do that, and, and, and if, if it's equipment yards or ditch banks or whatever it is, I mean, it's easily to see the difference driving down the road after two or three years of doing that. And we know that we can win with pigweed. The data, we have the data to tell us the research is there. It's published that, you know, four years, plus or minus pigweed seeds viable in the soil for four years. So if we can bury it for four years, I mean, we're just one deep tillage event. I mean, and I have reduced my pigweed population by over seventy percent. That's what all our all our data says. And so, and, and I'll I'll add for anybody just shivering at the thought that we're talking deep tillages is one inversion. It's not mixing. the The disc doesn't work. The chisel doesn't work. This is true inversion. But we we are looking at now that one inversion flip. And if you get right back over. It's not negatively influencing our soil physical structure or our biological inheritance of that environment. In fact, it could even help. And so the, the thought that, that tillage is all bad, it's, it's when you plow it every year and you're doing it for recreational tillage, that's bad. Right. Um, I agree. And I agree with what you said earlier because the best absolute cultural practice is, is flipping it like you're talking about, deep burial. And then come over the top with a cereal rye or a cover crop or palmer. I mean, if I had that cover crop on top of that tillage, now I've reduced my seed to or my emergence to 85% just on average, you know. And so that takes a lot of pressure off of our chemistry. And as we move forward, you know, when we when we look at what we have with what's coming down or potentially coming down the line with the Endangered Species Act and the herbicide strategy moving forward. I mean, it. I don't even want to think about leaving non-sprayed buffers from a residual standpoint. I mean, Palmer's going to take over Arkansas if we leave a large section with no practices for control at all. So, All right. You, you brought it up, all right? I don't I want to talk about it. Nice. I just wanted to bring a point. I don't really want to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> At least share with, uh, we don't have to go far, but but explain what you mean, because it is, it's been on the forefront of the soil scientist world in the last couple of months and year, but. Well, and I'll, I'll reference and say I'm, I'm not an expert in, in what they've released in, in terms of the, the herbicide strategy uh, and, you know, the sensitive species and exactly where they are. But but I will say we have put a lot of work in 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 developing comments and thought to you know what this could mean for Arkansas agriculture. I think you know uh, we all want to protect the environment. Number one, we all want to protect people. I mean, all of our farmers, if they weren't protective of the environment, they wouldn't have a a medium to farm in. And so they they understand that they're the last ones that want to. Uh, endanger the environment, you know, and so we all, we're all working collectively and the EPA has really uh, been helpful to work with us, uh, especially try to educate us on what, what they mean moving forward. And, and so what it all boils down to for herbicides, and I know fungicides and insecticides are coming, but the herbicides are first. And so uh, it's concern about either physical drift from point of application to a proposed or a sensitive area that could contain uh, endangered species or runoff. And so um, from a field, you know, after spraying into those areas and, and a lot of the education on our standpoint, since they're worried about physical drift or runoff, number one, we want to know if the endangered species actually exist in these environments. And I think they took those comments now and they're going back and doing some, some checking. So that's beneficial. I mean, they're, like I said, the EPA has been working with us and the Fish and Wildlife to uh, to try to verify some of this stuff. And and then, um, you know, so it, we're already doing a lot of conservation practices. Uh, our rice growers already have tailwater recovery systems where we're capturing all the water off of rice fields. And not all the fields, but a, a fair portion of them. We already have precision level ground, so it's not like we have a large, erodible 
amount of soil moving into the, our ditches. I mean, the farmers don't want that because they have to clean the ditches out for drainage every year. And so uh, we've kind of developed our fields over time to prevent a lot of this runoff. So I think a lot of the key points they're they're hitting on in this new herbicide strategy, we're already doing a lot of those. And so just education from our, you know, from what we're dealing with to, to what they think we have is, it's you know, that's kind of the process we're in right now. But Now we also, so along with the, the endangered species, we also have the, the registrations that we're looking at potentially being uh, lost in the near future. Could you kind of discuss a little bit about what's going on in that realm or what we're looking at not having as far as options? Well, and so, again, I don't think we know. There's a lot of, there's been a lot of discussion, you know, some key ones for us in cotton, diurons, number one, still very effective on our pigweed populations, but uh, it's not more on a, from an endangered species aspect. It's more from a, a cancer risk type aspect. And so there's still some research they're looking at. At one time, they were using the max available use rate as a standard of where it was always used. And, and you know, there's so many different applications where you can use diuron. When we use it in crop in cotton, it's like one of the lower use rates. So we're, you know, again, it's just that communication and education to understand the amount that's in the environment that, that we're, we're putting out when we spray it. And so, you know, we haven't heard a final definitive answer on it yet. I think they're reevaluating some of that. So we may get to keep it at lower use rates. But but uh, cotteran's another one they're talking about, depending on soil types. You know, atrazine for us is a big one um, because atrazine still really still works really good on our pigweed populations. And when I talk to my Midwest counterparts about that, they think I'm crazy, I think. But but uh, it's still very good on Palmer. Uh, we just haven't knock on wood. I'm gonna knock on my desk. Seen that resistance level build up uh, in our population yet? So those are the key ones that I'm worried about potentially losing in the new registration. But again, I think uh, I don't think we'll diuron is the one I'm concerned about the most. The others I think we'll be able to work with. It may just be looking at different application timings and rates. Okay, so I've got now I've got a a, a question for you, like a, a a scientific question that's been bothering me for about the last year as I've been doing work. You know, there there's certain chemistries and labels where organic matter is a factor, right? So organic matter content is a factor on rate, a factor on residual, a factor on plant back. When it comes to the label, what are they using to determine organic matter? Is that a six-inch sample? Uh, is that on a cultivated ground? If we're talking 25-year-old no-till that has a, you know, in, in my country, <clears throat> even after 25 years, we only have 3% total to six inches, but it's all of it's in the surface. That six inches, we have nothing. So that means our surface is like 10%. Is that? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't know that I can tell you how they make those calculations. I think it's just, you know, a, a statement that's included on those labels based off of soil classifications at a much earlier date than now. Uh, and, and to be honest, a lot of those classification maps aren't as accurate as I, as I wish they were as far as soil classes. But um you know, we're dealing with the same thing. I don't know that we have any soils in Arkansas, well, that we farm row crops on that are, I mean, it's all less than 3% over here. It's all, you know, basically river soils. So uh, it's hard for us to uh, build that organic. But like you say, many times on a lot of our farms, we're farming six inches of soil. And that's, that's it. Uh, after that, we get to a clay layer, compaction layers or something there. So, so how much, I guess along the lines, how much do you think, has it had anything, has it changed anything, has the movement towards no-till and cover cropping impacted how we should be managing our herbicides as far as now you've, now we're looking at so much more residual, right? We have so much more plant matter. Some of it's fairly green. We have more, especially on the residual types, we have to get down more. We're having much higher surface organic matter. We're changing the infiltration 
pattern of our soils. And for me, I see that most of these herbicides would have been developed and looked at and evaluated under conventional till management strategies. Right. And so I, they can absolutely perform differently to your point. I mean, the more residue there, it can intercept uh, that residual herbicide. And if we can't get it washed off of that, some of it will wash off, some of it won't. Uh, so we have less of a raid and you can see emergence in those areas uh, quicker. What our, you know, when we're talking about beans and cotton in Arkansas, and I'm not throwing everybody in the same box here, but for the most part, we're what we call reduced tillage. And so that means that we've either gone in and reshaped the beds in the fall or we do it in the spring. And that's just one pass with something like a, a level bander or better chopper type thing to, to give us that bed. And we need the bed for irrigation. And so we use beds for irrigation and drainage, both. And so uh, we like to have a, you know, a, a good planting surface bed, uh, especially for cotton with corn and beans, it can be a little rougher and we can get by with it. But, but uh, the big thing is, uh, you know, if we're going to reshape that bed, a lot of times it's just a stale seed bed. We'll plant the exact same bed that we did the previous year with, with limited work. And it just all goes back to the amount of rain we had at harvest. And if we run it up the field anywhere, yeah. not really. Fair and enough. so, it, you know, drainage is just as important for us as, as irrigation. And so, but having that stale bed system, to me, the residuals work much better in that system than they do even a fluffy bed. Because I want, you know, that fluffy dirt on a bed, I, when it rains, that residual can move a lot more readily. And, and so it, you're going to have gaps there as, as well. It's time for our famous three. Well, Tom, uh, I've enjoyed. We're kind of running out of time, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit us up with the last three questions I always ask my guests. And uh, first is, uh, what, what would you consider a go-to work resource for you? So a go-to work resource for me is our MP44. I actually have it right here. Nice. This is a book we publish every year. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm the first name on that here lately, so I get the headache of putting all, well, I say it's not just me. It's a team effort. It's a big team effort that we try to get the recommendations up to date uh, so that you can find all of this information on our website. It's uh, uaex.uada.edu. And so that's our main resource, I guess, for publications. And the easiest way to find anything on our website is just go in that little search bar and type it in because <laughs> it's hard to navigate. <laughs> Uh, so Tom, what do you do, uh, as a leisure? What do you do in your free time? Cause you got a lot of it. I know. Oh yeah. And all my free time. Uh, well, I've got two boys in college before they were in college. We did a lot of things, you know, I did a lot more, but I've, I've still got one at the house. Uh, all of my boys have been active in sports. So we're getting into baseball season now. And so I'm sure I'll watch a lot of baseball. And then we like to, uh, this time of year, we like to fish if I could ever go. So that's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I understand That's what's that. on my mind this weekend, but I probably won't yeah. get together. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping. I, I, we're about to that point. Crappie ought to be running here very soon up in my country and looking forward to it. Um, finally, uh, you've already mentioned one location, but what are some resources? Where can people go to find out more about what you're doing and what University of Arkansas is doing? Well, I'll tell you one that uh, we didn't mention before. And so myself and my counterparts, uh, we do a somewhat weekly podcast series, I'll call it. Uh, for the weed guys, it's the Weeds Are Wild podcast. Uh, we also have entomologists and pathologists that, and our rice specialists that post podcast updates. All of those are on Arkansas Row Crops Radio. So if you just want to Google Arkansas Row Crops Radio, it, you, it'll show you the long list, and then you can, I guess, subscribe to whichever one you want to subscribe to. But that's kind of our weekly seasonal in season updates. So, and again, this is Dr. Tom Barber, uh, professor, weed scientist, at University of Arkansas. I've greatly enjoyed him having on. Now, folks, if you enjoyed this, Tom's already mentioned it. Why don't you subscribe to this channel along with going to, to Weeds Are Wild? Uh, share with your friends, get more people listening. And, uh, you know, if you have any comments, feel free to reach out and suggest other guests we should bring on. Thank you.